Good morning, everyone. Um, it's another Sunday. Today we're going to talk about um, new families in the light of spiritism. I'm very happy to have a special guest in the audience today, which is my daughter sitting back there. So, yeah, so we're going to talk about um, new families. We recently did a lecture about families um, and spoke about the role of families, but today we are going to um, look at some different concepts, primarily from the codification and from the book Family Constellation by Givaldo Franco. We have in English, we have in Portuguese, we have available. It's an amazing book that I recommend uh, to everyone. So today we see in our society a diversity of families, right? Um, not too long ago, in the early 1900s, um, you look at families and you saw a mother, a father, two children. If you Google it, family, that's usually what comes up. Uh, at the most, a dog next to the kids. But today, when we look at the world, we see uh, diversity of uh, formations, family formations. And within that, we have, by all means, the uh, traditional family, we have adoptive families, we have foster families, we have an increased number of interracial families, which we didn't see much before, um, extended families, so you have, um, you know, uh, kids with their kids going back to their uh, parents' house, so you have kids and, and families living with grandparents, sometimes uh, siblings uh, sharing homes, and so you have also families who um, were traditional, uh, divorce, and then they marry, and now you have a husband with his children, a wife with her children from previous marriage, and then you have suddenly a whole bunch of kids from different marriages living together within uh, the same roof. Uh, you have homosexual families, you have an increased number of single parents, uh, both men raising children and women raising children alone. So it looks very diverse, uh, our uh, families today. And the human law has uh, definitely um, adjusted and has been recognizing that family is something that is changing and has adapted to uh, the changes, the social and cultural changes. So for instance, in Brazil, um, stable unions are now recognized under the law. So if you have two persons living under the same roof for a period of time and it's proven that there is a stable relationship, right? Those two persons will be recognized as a family whether they have married or not. That's a change in the law that follows the progress, the social and cultural uh, progress that uh, we see. So, I'll show you a little bit of the demographics of Brazil and in the U.S. as well. So in Brazil, for example, uh, this is an article that talks about the traditional Brazilian family. And the conclusion is there is no such thing as traditional Brazilian family anymore. Actually, what we think of traditional family in Brazil is 50% of the population of families. The other 50 are diverse families, all other kinds of families. Uh, 10 million families are one-parent families. Um, there's another uh, significant shift in families because with women uh, being inserted in the workforce, um, different than before when women were at home, uh, nowadays we see a number of households where women is actually the main provider. And so you got 37% of that as a mother, the main provider in the family. So a significant change as well. In these uh, last census in Brazil, there were 60,000 homosexual families and 53% of them were uh, women families. So when we look at the U.S., here's some stats on the families in the U.S. So 
you have two parent biological married families, about 60%. Then you have cohabiting families, uh, not married. You have step family, cohabiting step family, single mother, single father, no parent family. So again, uh, diversity of, uh, of families represented in the US as well. And then we have some interesting uh, trends that we see happening, changes in, uh, in our culture. So the first graph is mothers as the sole or primary provider. So the, the change in women role within family. The second graph is two parent household in decline. So um, for a period of time when those researches were done, if there were two parents um, living in the same house but not married, they didn't consider a two-parent uh, household. It was considered a single-parent household, although there were two people in there because the law didn't recognize that union. Nowadays, it does. So that's also uh, different. Here's another interesting one. Um, so one in six kids is living in a blended family. And um, <clears throat> so, Percent of the children living with a step parent, step sibling, or half sibling. So we're looking at um, changes and also uh, mixing of uh, races and the decoupling of marriage and childbearing. So number of births to unmarried uh, women. So there, there are like graphs and graphs and graphs that I could bring that shows, you know the tremendous amount of change that we see today in society. Are they good or bad? Are the forces driving them good forces, positive forces, or negative forces, right? And how do we understand all these changes? Are they in line with the spiritist vision? How is spiritism helps us to understand all these uh, changes that we see nowadays in society, particularly in the realm of families? And that's what we are going to talk about today. So there are some threats to the family institution. Um, so these would be on the negative uh, side of things, right? And so <clears throat> we see today, and Joanna Jones just talks about that, a crumbling of ethic and morals in our society. Um, so in the very introduction of the book, she says, currently, on earth, the family constellation is being attacked due to the disorders and dissatisfaction overcoming the hearts and the minds of the young. Perplexed by the distressed adults, the immature and irresponsible young hearts let themselves be dragged by the utopias of pleasure, neglecting crucial obligations towards the family and the home which are in fact blessings. Instead, they let go and throw themselves into the abyss of desperate hallucinations plotting against the family institution. So the, the youth not having a good reference in the parents, not having good morals and ethics at home and getting uh, lost in some ways. But more than that, the apparent failure of unions of matrimony so the failures of our relationships, of our marriages, and those descending from it, it's not caused by the family, rather by the crumbling of ethics and morals. So our families are failing, not because of the family itself, but because of the lack of ethics and moral in, within the individual and within society. So she speaks about this thirst to live well, so in our, our society today, uh, we want to live well, make the most of our life, have as much as possible, enjoy life as much as possible, as opposed to a culture of a well-living life, which is different, which is a life of harmony, it's a life of peace, it's a life of inner well-being. And she points out materialism and individualism as culprits of this um, state of disorganization and, and behind the threats that we see to the family institution. So we live in a very, very, very materialistic society. And we are all, all, including all of us in this room, 
very materialistic driven. Although we have some concepts, nice concepts of spirituality, we are very much engulfed by this uh, culture of consuming, expanding, and putting so much emphasis on having. And these are some threats because nowadays we see that we tend to live and there is a trend and a push towards individualism. And so if I show you, for instance, this picture, right? Now, I have seen this in my family, in my home, in my extended family, and everywhere in society. So there was a period of time where families had one television. And by the end of the day, they sat together after dinner and watch television together and share comments about what they were seeing and they had to actually come to an agreement on what show they would see together. Nowadays one television is not enough. It became a necessity, mind you, a fake necessity, that every single room in the house must have a television so by the end of the day after spending an entire day separated from one another you eat quickly and you rush to your room and close the doors. And then, or even worse, you sit at the table and you pick up your electronic and that sacred moment where you come together to say hello, how are you? How was your day? This is it, right? Sometimes families are apart, they come together for a weekend. Let's get together. And they get together in the living room and then everybody sits together in the same environment, each person with their electronics. There is something essentially unhealthy in this practice. And I'm not making anything about technology. I'm a huge fan of technology. But it's not the technology, it is how we are handling the technology. So um, we are unfortunate that technology is in some ways contributing and threatening this very important sacred institution as we'll see which is family. And in question 775 of the Spirits book, Kardec asked the Spirits, what would be the result for society family ties were relaxed? A magnification of selfishness. Magnification, so selfishness exists, but if family ties are weakened, this selfishness will be enhanced, will be even more prevalent, prominent in our society. So these are some things that, these are some of the threats that we are seeing and things that we need to uh, be aware of. And we're going to get deeper into this in a minute. But not everything is bad. There are some good things happening as well. So let's look at some positive shifts that we see with the new family formations. There are, and this is uh, based on uh, research done by psychologists, a shift where before uh, individuals, they live to, for the happiness of the family. So what does that mean? That means you had a very traditional model of family that was very hierarchical and male driven. So if the value of, if the father was a physician, right? And there is a tradition of physicians in the family. God forbid that little boy or girl wants to be, I don't know, engineer, huh? engineer. engineer. or even worse, a teacher, right? <laughs> Or even worse, a speech therapist, a, 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 a profession that is traditionally considered a female profession and now you have a boy. So the family would put pressure on that kid and a lot of times forbid that kid to be who he is for the family happiness, for the image of the family. That was the prevailing concept, the most important concern that we had as a society. Nowadays, we see a shift. Family is a space where we come together to foster individual happiness. And I'm not the one saying this. This is the research that says that. So I'll show you um, what it says. 
Family is no longer an institution protected by itself and oblivious to the fulfillment of its parts, each one of us. It has become a space of personal development, focusing on the dignity of its members. So there's much more attention nowadays to the individual, to fostering, to developing the happiness of each member of the family. And the basis of uh, current families are dignity and affection. Now, this is not spiritism, this is uh, science. This is psychology, looking at uh, the families today. This trend is so established in our society that in Brazil, the word family has been redefined in some dictionaries. And so recently, uh, before the redefinition, uh, this is also by another uh, researcher, he says, family, group essentially formed and based on affection. And affection means respect to members' individualities and preservations of human dignity. So affection means recognizing, for example, that our children don't have to be a mirror of ourselves. This is respecting and honoring the dignity of the individual. The fact that I have certain values and want certain things for me doesn't give me the right to want it. I want the happiness, but happiness for my child must can mean something different than what it means to me. So valuing, honoring is bringing dignity into the family. So the, the dictionary has changed the, the, trans, the definition from social nuclei of persons linked by affection. They usually share the same space and maintain among themselves relationships based on solidarity. So that, my dear friends, is the definition of family today. Very different than the very narrow definition of a man, a woman, uh, blood families, uh, biological families, it's a much more extended, broader concept of family that has been socially, culturally, legally recognized, which speaks to us about the law of progress, which we will talk in a moment. So, how do we, what is the vision of spiritism? How do we understand all those things? And I love the glasses, right? because if I take my glasses off, right, you're all blurry right now. <laughs> and so I need to put them on so I can see you well. And spiritism is just like that. Our vision of life is blurry. A lot of times we look at society, we look at different families, and we judge them with our blurry vision because we don't have the spiritual lenses that allow us to see what it is in its essence. And so Spiritism talks to us about the essence of life, about the meaning of families, and helps us to then focus on what is essential, which as you see is not the form, is what is within the form. So let's look at some very basic concepts. <clears throat> so in the Gospel of Matthew 12, 49, we have uh, Jesus saying, Hear my, my mother and my brothers. And we find the interpretation of this passage in the Gospel according to Spiritism chapter, honor your father and your mother. And in there, uh, we learn about uh, spirit, spirit ties and corporeal ties. We learn about universal family and blood family or our corporeal family, right? And this is a very important concept because when we have a child, a biological child, the parents did not create the spirit. The parents create only the body, right? So that spirit does not belong to you. It belongs to God. We live under the illusion without our glasses that our children are ours, but they truly aren't. Nor we, are, nor we belong to our parents. We just, it's just a temporary landing, right? For a period of time. So, true family, according to the gospel, are not therefore blood ties, but ties of sympathy 
of affinity, similarity of ideas that connect spirits before, during the present, and in the future reincarnation. Those are the two family ties because we are immortal spirits. How many families have we had? God knows, hundreds, hundreds. So what happens is, what constitutes our real spiritual family are the affections that we develop and that we carry on. So here in the spiritual center, I know for a fact that I have many members of my spiritual family. Because I met them and you feel that there is already a story behind. There is already sympathy. There is already love and we are just continuing on. This is the spiritual family. Blood families, the gospel says, are fragile, just like matter. And a lot of times, a lot of times, you may be born in a, in a, in a particular family and might have some experience and move forward without ever really developing the depths of affection that will sustain their relationship. It may not turn into anything negative, but it may just not have that sparkle of affection and affinity. And you move on, and that person is someone that you know, but is not, has not integrated your spiritual family, so to speak, by the definition. So, Joana de Angelis, she says, the family that resulted from the union of spirits coming from different backgrounds, uniting themselves either by blood or by affection, although the temporarily of their coexistence, the, the you know short time that we spend together, open spaces for future perennial constellation. So is the family constellation that will prevail, that will go on when beings will consider themselves as brothers and sisters and will struggle together because they will recognize the divine paternity. So, like I was saying, we come here temporarily and a lot of times what will happen as a result of this temporary and very frail union, we will develop some relationships that will become perennial, that will become eternal, that will go with us as we move forward. And what we learn, the essence, the very essence of coming together as a family is that we learn to love ourselves as brothers and sisters. So if I have lived with Biga, she has been my cousin, my aunt, my whatever it is, we have learned to love one another as sisters right now. That is the goal. That is the goal. No matter which role you are playing in the family, the goal is that we will love one another's brothers and sisters. In question 774 of the Spirit's book, it says, social ties are necessary for progress and family ties are summed up in social ties. Family ties are a natural law. God has thus will that humans learn to love one another as brothers and sisters. So we have Joanna and we have Kardec. Different statements, same concept. Just reiterating for us what is the ultimate goal of our relationships, and in particular, our families. Now, another concept is the concept of law of progress. And so, very briefly, right? Everything is progressing. We are progressing. Society is progressing. Families are progressing. And so, Progress is a condition of human nature. It's on question 781 for the ones who are studying the Spirit's book. So much information. Now, also in the Spirit's book, we learn in question 795, the human law is variable and progressive. The more we understand justice, the better the laws become. So as we evolve morally, scientifically, the laws will continue to progress. And many laws have been already reformed and many more will be. This is a statement in question 797. And the Spirit says, wait a while and you will see all the changes there are to come. So we shouldn't be surprised to see changes, to see movement, because there is no progress without movement. 
right? And the laws are gradually catching up with our um, moral progress. Now, family too has progressed. So, Joana de Angelis, and this is all from the book Family Constellation, she talks about the evolution of family. There was a point of time where we people gathered together just to seek protection against the fire, against the animals. That was the concept of family. There was a point in time in Greece who says that people would gather around uh, a fire. They considered that a sacred fire to per perpetuate the memory of their ancestors. There was a larger group and that was considered a family back then. So family has been changed. Then at a certain point, when we became a little bit more conscious of our duties with our children, then the family narrowed to that small group within the household, which actually uh, generated some selfishness, according to her, uh, in detriment to the well-being of society. So we, we, we closed up in our small little families. But family, the definition of family, the understanding of family is not only changing now, it has been changing, it has been progressing. That's the idea that she brings. Now, let's talk about family. So, culturally, we think of family as um, an organization, a social organization, right? People come together. But when we put the lenses of spiritism, family becomes a lot more important. Family becomes a divine institution with a very divine purpose. And that's what we're going to talk about. Joanna, in chapter 2, of family constellation, she says, family is the foundation upon which society is built, being the spirit, being the spirit primary school where its latent faculties are awakened and developed. So the foundation upon which society is built. There's a lot of correlation between family and society and spiritism. And not always that is so clear in our mind. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Because how do we think we're going to make this world a better place? Where do we start? How do we transform our societies? Where is the starting point? Where is the source? So when we look at this uh, graph here that I, I made, right? So at the top, you have the spiritual realm, and that guy walking over there, he's walking towards reincarnation. That's the idea. So the big circle is our society. I want you to think about society as a body, right? And a body is made of cells. So each family is a cell that constitutes that body. Now, each individual within a family is a structure of the cell, is a part of the cell. So we will never have a healthy society if the cell is a dysfunction or if the part of the cell is dysfunctional as well, right? So if a little particle in my cell, a little structure in my cell is not working properly, that cell will become dysfunctional. Soon my body is dysfunctional. Same thing with society. So for us to have a healthy society, we need to have healthy families and we need to have healthy individuals. So I put a few <clears throat> concepts over there and this is precisely what I'm talking about. The health of society depends on the health of the parts that compose it. The health of the parts depend on the health of the elements that form it. Now, why is this so important? Because in this is an outstanding concept, right? The gist of enlightenment is relationships. Okay? The gist of enlightenment is in relationships. Okay? Relationships relating is fundamental for spiritual growth. Family relating things, the experience of loving someone as he, she truly is. True learning of love. And virtues can only be tested and measured in the context of relating and relationships. So let's talk a little bit about those things, right? All right. I went to a retreat 
and the retreat focuses on patience and tolerance. I spend one entire week fasting, meditating, praying, doing mindful work about compassion and patience. Then I come home. <laughs> then I come home. Now you are going to measure, measure. The family life is the thermometer because it's not here in the spiritual center. No, no, no. Because here we bring our best face, our best behavior, right? It's at home where we are who we are. You think you're doing really good? Made a lot of improvement coming to the uh, spirits book study, coming to the center three times a week. You're doing really that well. If you want a clear measurement of how well you're doing spiritually, you need to look at your closest relationships. The people you spend the most amount of time. How healthy are your relationships? How much trouble are you having? How much difficulty are you having? That is the thermometer of your spiritual enlightenment. And this is why family life is so vital. Because, because, first, it gives us opportunity to the true practice of love. Because I receive a million messages of people who watch me speaking and think that I am like, I don't know what. And I'm always like, oh my God, if they would just, just work in the spiritual center with me to see how rough I am, they would change their minds. They would change their minds. It's so difficult for us to love that God is so incredibly wise that he said this to us. Let's start with four and five people and see if you can manage that. <laughs> That's what family life is about. You know, that uh, she was reading for us the beginning here, love your enemies. No. Love the people who gave your life, respect your father, your mother, your children. Let's start very little, guys, because the task is huge. So when you go, and then what happens is, so we will practice those things, right? And we will ship these people out to society, our children, ourselves. And then in society, we're going to interact with each other, bringing to society the values that we are learning at home. And that's how we change society. So let's look at... Heaven and hell, heaven and hell, chapter three. Chapter three talks about heaven. So it says, so, societal life is the touchstone of good and bad qualities. That's where you are going to put to test. And the first society that we live in is our family. It's the small society, okay? So heaven and hell, chapter three is worth reading. So. How family is going to help to change the world? How are we going to make the world a better place? Basically, through education. Okay? And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So, <clears throat> everybody, most of you are probably familiar with the book uh, Genesis. In the very end of Genesis, chapter 18, talks about the new generation. The new era. The new generation. And when we think about the new generation, we think about all these little kids that are being born, and we think usually about the new bodies that are arriving on this planet. But the new generation is a generation of spirits. They are coming to change the world. But they need to find solid homes. They need to find a solid base. They need to find solid parents that can give them the ethics and the morals to transform the world. Parents who understand that success is not only intellectual success. Success, a lot of times, the spirits who arrive on the other side of life, they have been successful. Not necessarily they were anyone to the world, but they were people that anonymously made a difference. And the question is, are those the values that we nurture in our families? with our children? Is this what we're preparing them for? To be peacemakers, 
or to be some snobbish intellectual academic person. Now, I'm, a, I'm an academic, so I'm not putting down the, the academic uh, wall, but I'm just giving an example, right? So, in the Spears book, and I'm sorry, I forgot the question, but it says there is an element that has not been sufficiently pondered and without which economic science is nothing more than theory. Education. Not intellectual education, but moral education. Not moral education through books, but that which create habits, because education is the sum of acquired habits. So we need to be home creating new habits in our children, starting from ourselves, because they learn from watching us through example. Jesus in the book, Gospel at Home, uh, chapter one by Neri Lucio, he says, the home is the true exporter of individuals to community life. The home is the true exporter of individuals to community life. The question is, what are we exporting? Are we doing our roles in educating, right? What are we doing for ourselves, right? So that we are better individuals in the community. And this is a, <clears throat> in question 582, uh, a very um, strong uh, warning that the spirits give us to us parents. Because it says that parenthood is a mission, no doubt, it's written, without a doubt, Parenthood is a mission, but also a very great duty to be fulfilled. And in the middle of the paragraph, the spirits are going to say, however, there are those who are more concerned with training the trees in their orchards and make them bring forth fine fruit than with the training of the character of their children. So there are some parents out there they are distracted. That's pretty much what it's talking about. And look at the, the strength of this sentence, of this statement. There are people who literally work, spend more time trimming their plants and make sure they're growing the right direction and in the right shape than taking the time to shape up the soul of all their children. Obviously, it's a lot more work. Right? Not as fun. Right? At first, apparently. Right? So, we are invited to the job of education. And so, now we're going to look, starting to close, right? What Joana de Angelis proposes as education. And we're going to see how, and this is what's really beautiful, how emerges with all the advances in psychology and in science, all the research that we brought in the beginning because she's going to talk about authenticity, authenticity and healthy independence in the family. One should encourage, listen, one should encourage the child to be authentic, avoiding concealment and hypocrisy that through psychological mechanism pleases the adults and hides the reality and sensitivity of the child. So a lot of times we are educating with coercive methods, a lot of times uh, limiting the child in her natural expression, trying to domesticate our children without honoring their individuality, their sensitivity, what makes them unique. A child deserves to live in a world built to understand her from the beginning so that in turn she can offer a better one to those that will follow. Education with love is the most effective method to achieve balance in the family, <clears throat> uniting all members in loving interdependence while at the same time free from individualistic passions and creation of sick liaison. In other words, Healthy interdependence. Yes, we all depend on one another. We all count on one another. But we don't hold people hostage. We don't hold our children hostage. 
right? We don't hold our spouse hostage. Marriages, right? Marriages should also be about that. Marriages is not two people who become one. Should never be that. Marriage are two people who always be two people in a partnership. With respect, respect of individual projects, of individual dreams, of individual desires, of individual networks. We don't need to be intertwining every single thing that our partner does. We need to have a common ground because otherwise it's not a relationship. But I love the idea of the circles that have the shared space, but you also have your separate lives and space to be, right? So healthy interdependence without sick codependence. So educate for that, educate for peace. We should be educating our children for peace. Education should be focused on the achievement of peace to pacify the inner torments of our children, our own inner torments. We are not going to see peace in the world if we don't experience peace within. The peace outside always is going to mirror our inner state. So the home should be a place where we're working towards the peace of the group. And finally, friendship. And Juan is going to say, friendship is an uplifting emotion that should prevail in the human be uh, behavior, preparing them for a great flight of love. So development of friendship among the family, with your children, with your spouse. Because if you have been married for a long time, you know that the quality of your marriage changed. You know the marriage is a very, very difficult journey. You wake up every day, problems, challenges, very little time, a lot of times to nurture the relationship. But if it's a solid friendship has been built, then that friendship is the force that's going to help the couple to withstand the forces of time, of routine, and everything else. So with all that in mind, right? With all that in mind, we go back to the very beginning and we ask ourselves, the new families, what's wrong with them? At the very end of the day, it's not who is living under the roof, it's not how many people are living under the roof, is are those elements under the roof and that's what spiritism tells us about families yes there is a lot of problems in our society today in need of the light of education more education from the individual to the family to society a lot of families are being formed by not so positive ways not so positive forces because, for instance, the institution of marriage has become very shallow at times. People get married a lot of times without basic knowledge of who they are married. And so that sets us for failure in so many ways. But at the end of the day, going back to Joanna on our final thoughts, she says, changes will continue occurring according to the achievements of the new era. But this does not mean that the family will lose its cornerstones. And what are the cornerstones of family? Loyalty to the group, mutual support, protection, as a result of a loving feeling, preparing for the union with other associations in the universal identity. So when we look at a family, no matter which family we're looking at, right? When we put the lenses of spiritism, we don't rush to judge what we see by the shape or by the form. We put the lenses and we look at the family formation by what is essential. Does it have those cornerstones? Loyalty to the group, above our personal interests. Mutual support. Family is a space of cooperation, right? Is there protection? Is there loving feeling? And with loving feeling comes patience, comes tolerance, 
People say, oh, it's so much easier to live alone. Sure it is. I'm in my home. I'm tired at the end of the day. I want to be in the room with the light off. Then comes my son running and turns the light on. Right? So now comes someone and puts the music on. That's family life. Family life. That's the richness, the beauty of family life. It's the sacred place where we are going to practice tolerance, respect, flexibility, right? And sacrifice in a good sense, not in a bad sense, because at the end of the day, you may feel I'm losing this moment of peace, but what you get in exchange is, is incredible. It's incredible. Only if you have it and you experience you know. It's incredible. The rewards of love. The rewards of love. And she's going to finish saying, are, are we being successful in our family? So the success of a family constellation can be measured by the results of union and friendship to the ties that become stronger and continue even when each member moves towards their destiny, passing to society the benefits they possess. So, are we being successful? Look at your family, you know? Are those factors over there, right? Success, what is the measure, the spiritual measure? The spiritual measure of success is not how many people we sent to college, it's not how many kids graduated with honor rolls in school. That's not what measures, spiritually speaking, the success of our families. The success of our families is measured by the union, by the friendship, that we are developing with those who are next to us. The bonds of love, of affection, that will translate in the extension of our perennial family, of our spiritual family. Bonds that will remain with us past this life to the rest of our lives. So with that, I end my um, talk and, you know, always uh, uh, like to share the, the how special this uh, topic is to me right and um, and when I when I study it when I study it it um, just gives me tremendous tremendous joy to have the opportunity being a gay person in his life to have a family which it wasn't possible so long ago. And to be able to tell my kids today and to go to the schools where they study, to tell the kids how we have done recently in the last month, Sherry and I, to my son's uh, school, to tell the kids about new families, new formations, and what is really important, right? So I feel extremely blessed to have the opportunity to have these kids and to have this family and to be able to, you know, some people may look and say, that's a different family. But spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, we are committed precisely to this work, right? And valuing the, the, the sacred space of family for what it is. So that's the message. And I would like to open for your comments at this time.